Well, good evening. Wow, that's a quiet room. Hello. <laughs> that's what you like. <laughs> One more time. Good evening, everybody. There we go. All right, just a little bit of life in the room there. It is good to see you. Uh, welcome back for week number five on marriage, but week number eight all together for Family Matters. And tonight we have, uh, it'll be a little different. Tonight's going to look different than the other nights have. We'll explain that here as we go along. Let me give you just one announcement. We will not meet next Wednesday. It is spring break. So we will not have family matters. We won't have dinner. Everything will uh, take a break this next week. But then we will be back for one more week on marriage and then we make a pivot after that, and we are going to look at uh, several different things. We're going to spend a week talking about finances. We're going to spend a week talking about how do you navigate busyness in our culture and the effect that that has on our marriages and on our kids and just our schedules and everything else. And then we're going to spend the last five weeks together looking at parenting and what God's word has to say about how we raise our children. So that's, that's what's coming, but I uh, wanted to give you that little preview. Tonight, we are talking about what God's word has to say about the topic of divorce. And you may think, well, that's an, an odd topic to discuss when we're talking about marriage. And, and you may think, well, not, why would I be here tonight for that? Because I'm, I'm not divorced. I haven't walked through divorce. And so maybe this doesn't pertain to me. I want to say, no, actually, you need to hear what's going to be said tonight. There are stories that are going to be shared. We have a panel that are going to share some of their story and what God has done in and through their lives. And I think this is going to be incredibly helpful for all of us. Uh, to, to hear, to understand, uh, and just to give hope to, to what God can do in, in our lives. We need to hear what God's word has to say, to think about things the way God thinks about them, but then to understand what it is he can do in and through our marriages, in people around us, how we can minister to people. And it's just going to be a really good night. I'm looking forward to this. I think it's going to be excellent. I'm really appreciative of our panel. They're right here at this table. They're going to be up here in just a minute. Thank you guys for being willing to come and share some of your story. Uh, and I know God's going to use it. I know he has used it already in some incredible ways. I uh, love every one of you guys and appreciate how God uses you um, and your willingness to be used. And so I know tonight's just going to be a continuation of that. So thank you for being here. Let me pray and I'm going to get out of the way and hopefully don't have to have too many. That's what Sue said moments tonight. Yeah, so meant, what Sue meant to say, right? Yeah, okay. What Sue meant to say. Father, we pause tonight just to say thank you for this time that we have together. God, thank you for your word, uh, for the foundation uh, that it gives us on which to build our lives. Thank you that it is truth and that we can trust it. God, it teaches us about who you are. God, it teaches us about how we should live. And God, I thank you so much that tonight as your word is opened and as uh, things are shared tonight, God, I pray that you would be glorified in them. God, that you would teach us, that we would be attentive to hear from you. Uh, guide the words, the thoughts uh, of everyone that will share tonight. We thank you for them, for their willingness to be here. And God, we lift this all up to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Hit it, Sue. Since since the pastor brought it up, uh oh, uh oh, what, what pastor meant to, meant to say? Let's start off with a question. Raise your hand if you have personally experienced divorce, have contemplated divorce, have a family member who has gone through a divorce, or a close friend. Raise your hand. Look at that. We've all almost, almost everyone unanimous. in this room, right? It is a part of our world, a part of our society. And we are a family in our church. And what we talk about is how can we come alongside each other in our joys, 
our struggles, our sorrows, our loss. So we have to be willing to talk about these hard topics and go to God for what he has to say and that we are prompted by the Holy Spirit as we come alongside each other, right? So that's what tonight is all about and why we're talking about divorce. All right. So some previous takeaways. So believe it or not, these last uh, four, five weeks have kind of led up to this because we wanted some groundwork. Not that this is the, the keystone topic, but um, we, we wanted to lay some groundwork so that as we talked about a very difficult topic, divorce, we had a lot of background and a lot of biblical knowledge leading us to this. And so for week one, we remember we talked about all the myths that invade our marriage, and we talked about a covenant view of marriage and not a contractual view. Divorce is a contractual view of marriage. If you entertain even 1% of your brain, it, it entertains divorce. If that's in the back of your mind as an option, you are thinking about your marriage in contractual terms. Uh, in week two, we remember we did the fruit of the spirit, thorns of the flesh. Whoever guides your thoughts guides your actions, behaviors, and words. This is so critically important on this topic of divorce. Who is guiding your actions, your thoughts, and your words? And three, again, do we have a contractual view or a covenantal view of marriage? Last week, we, we talked about God calls us to forgiveness and he gives us a ministry of reconciliation. The heart of Abba Father is forgiveness and reconciliation. And then th this last point I just threw in there because I love gospel fluency in the book, but are we becoming gospel fluent? When we talk to others who are, are talking about divorce, do we offer a biblical perspective? Are we talking gospelly correct to those who we come alongside? All right, so let's some key points about divorce that we want. God hates divorce, but he loves the divorced. Uh, let me say that again. God hates divorce, but he loves the divorced. Divorced people in church, wherever we meet, uh, uh, that, they're not second-class citizens. God loves the divorce. That is a theme we want to reinforce. Um, what often happens in divorce is that one party or both have ceased placing the gospel first. Again, that's why gospel fluency is so important. We see this as we mentor couples where the gospel has taken second place to secular thinking. God wants me to be happy. He doesn't want me to be in this unhappy. Remember that triangle we described in that first week that uh, as I move closer to God in my personal walk, then that affects my behavior. And as my husband moves closer, then we move closer. But it's all about where are you with Jesus Christ? There's no out clause. I want to just hammer that home. There's no out clause in God's covenant design for marriage. Ha <laughs> ha. Irreconcilable differences is another term for unforgiveness. Irreconcilable differences. Just think unforgiveness. Same thing with incompatibility is another word for selfishness. So think biblically when we put those words on a divorce decree. God loves marriage. It's his design tool for sanctification, and his purpose in marriage is to make us holy. Here's one thing uh, I want to share very quickly before we let uh, our panel share their hearts. When my husband talks about this, we have been praying about this and this tough topic, and how do we speak truth and love as we share and come alongside and about broken relationships, and healing, restoring our relationship with our God. So here's what hit me as I was praying. Um, God says he hates divorce. And I was thinking about that. Why would he say it? And then it hit me. It takes me a while. I'm 65. It just takes me a while. It hit me. We all talked the very first week that we agreed who designed marriage. 
God designed marriage. And when he designed it, it was perfect before sin entered the world. So with that being his heart and a heart for relationships, why would he agree to man breaking up that marriage? Right? He designed it. And we know he's perfect. And we know he's constant and unchanging. So that's how I worked why my God hates divorce, because he designed a beautiful picture of an earthly relationship as close as I can get to him physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So that's my two cents. So last week we watched a series of short videos. And by the way, if there's not a handout, there is, it's in the, at the last page of your handout are some, the, the links to those five videos that we watched last week. They're four minutes long. They're in Right Now Media. But in one of those, uh, pastor a pastor talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and Paul just, I mean, very emphatic again for, to the Corinthians, and he says, why? Why do you go to the courts to separate what, what God has put together? Is there no one among you capable of mediating these issues? Why do we go to the courts to separate what God has put together? Uh, divorce is a personal decision, never a divine mandate. God doesn't want us to do that. And God's desire is always for forgiveness and reconciliation. There are consequences for disobedience to God's word, not only in the terms of divorce, but divorce kind of codifies uh, the disobedience, if you if you will, so it adds a, a, a permanence there that makes it somewhat troublesome. Uh, there are circumstances in which separation and possibly divorce are necessary. Though, so the Bible does give us some out clauses, but that is, you know, what did Jesus say? Yeah, Moses allowed it because of your hard heartedness. Again, God's. God's heart is for forgiveness and reconciliation. The other thing we've learned, and I know you all have experienced this as well, as we have come alongside couples, there are times when your situation may be that you need to remove yourself for healthy, for your health and safety, or you may need to get your own house in order if you're struggling with addiction or something that you need to work on you and then allow God to work towards your own personal reconciliation and restoration, whatever that looks like between you and God. Key point here, don't walk through struggles alone, but choose your friends carefully. You remember in those videos last week, both of those two first couples, the, the, the woman said, well, you know, friends came alongside me and they we were picking people to choose sides. If there are sides and there are friends that are taking sides, you've chosen the wrong friends, okay? You've chosen the wrong friends. Choose those that will speak biblical truth to your marriage. In love. In love. Um, and this is a no-brainer, but it, it's good to re revisit this. Here are the sin that most commonly promotes divorce. Pride. Pride. Bitterness, regret, anger, unforgiveness, unforgiveness, selfishness. And lastly, through it all, God can redeem all of our bad decisions. And King David is a perfect example. Violated three of the commandments, and yet the lineage of Jesus Christ comes through the line of David. So God can redeem all of our yuck, as Michelle so eloquently says. Okay. So those are the key those are the key points we want you to hold on to. You also have in your handout or one of the handouts was God's purpose and design for marriage. This is kind of the church's stand on marriage and divorce. I commend it to you, okay, that you read that and and know that. All right. Let's get to it. Let's so we have a panel that's going to answer some questions who have either been through divorce or have come right up to the precipice of divorce. And so we're going to ask them some questions. So David and Michelle Burkett, come, come, on, on, down. come on down. 
We can toss you chocolate if you need it. Michael and the absent Tanya Edwards. Come on down. <laughs> there's no way. There's no way Tanya's going to allow Michael to do this solo. There's no. She's going to come in at the last moment. I know it. She, she actually texted Sue. She sent audio. M my wife texted Sue an audio of her comment, <laughs> and written out so that I would be supervised this evening. <laughs> I don't doubt that. Lance and Elaine Schladier, come on down. Last but not least, Jerry and Joni Weeks. Thank you, guys. Okay, so um, we're going to start with over here with Jerry and Joni, and they're going to just briefly give you their story, and we're going to listen to all four stories, and then we have a series of questions, which you have, by the way. Um, uh, we're, they're going to answer these questions. Also, is there a number they can text? Okay, so during this, if you have a question that pops up in your mind and you have a burning question, text it to 22333. Pastor Daniel will be over there and he'll, he'll look at those questions and then we'll hopefully review some of them. Yeah, let me just, just tell you, if you text in a question, um, I cannot see who it is texting that in. So it is anonymous, so you can feel the freedom to ask what you need to. Um, just make sure when you text it, you have to put um, FB281 in front of your text that you send in, um, or I won't get it. So the number is there to text, but then you also have to add FB281 to the beginning of the message uh, before you send in a question. So just okay. wanted to give you that. And you can do that at any time. I'll be collecting them. And we can, if we have time at the end, we'll cover some of those. Okay. All right. Jerry and Joni, ready. you're up. Okay. I'm Joni. And um, listening to Rick and Sue, my first thought is this is not a club you want to be a part of. Not only because of the consequences that we live because of it, and we'll speak of that later, but as Rick said, it is a broken covenant with God, and that is the most heartbreaking part of divorce and, and living through that afterwards. Um, okay, I grew up right down the road in Hunt, Texas. To um, I was born into a very Christian family. My mother was the spiritual rock of our family, and... The light of Jesus shone through her so brightly, and I was drawn to that all of my childhood and something that was very um, out front to me. My father is a believer, but I didn't see the fruit in his life. And as a young child, he and I kind of had a difficult time. He was very strict. He was very much a disciplinarian, and I didn't ever feel I could live up to his expectations so as a child, that hurt my heart, and that began my journey with a hardened heart and a very destructive lifestyle. So through <clears throat> high school and even college, I was on the run. I ran whenever I was hurt. I ran away first to boarding school in Indiana, and later on, I ran to Washington, D.C. to get as far away from my family as I could. Um, it was a time that... I was searching for earthly things, worldly things, to heal my heart. And like I say, it was a very dark time. I went through years of boys, men, drugs, and alcohol, and it overtook my life for many, many years. When I was 17, I moved to Washington, D.C. to um, help my congressman's family. I was a good friend with them. I took care of their kids, and he wanted me to come work on the Hill for the summer, and I stayed 25 years. Um, after that, I did go to school and got my master's in special education, and that began my career as a teacher. So as I finished school, it was always a desire to be a wife and a mother, but I wasn't really sure how to look for that as my life had been so dark. Um, but I, I did meet someone after college, and that was when my hardened heart began to change 
because I knew I was going to be responsible for someone else other than myself. And mainly that would be my children as a family. <clears throat> so I met my first husband, Doug. And a year and a half later, he and I were married, and we had three children, and life was pretty good. We were very plugged in to a church. I was involved in Bible study fellowship. I had my children and Wednesday night, Sunday, growth group. We were very plugged in, and my heart was changing, and I was seeking the Lord to change the habits that had been so destructive through all those years. We had been married about 10 years, and Doug's demeanor changed. He was absent from our family. He was gone at night. He was gone for days, and when he did show up, he was a very angry man, and our marriage became filled with se sexual and physical abuse. And I did just about everything I knew to get us help. We started with our church pastor. We started with our church counselor. We went to doctors. We went to secular counselors because that's what he wanted to do. Um, I had reached out to people to help me protect my children. That was something in the state of Virginia. If I were to leave my marriage with my children, it would have been abandonment, and I had to walk away from all assets. So I was fighting as much as I could while I did protect my children. And for three years, my kids and I slept behind a locked door at night so that I could keep them safe. And it was during those three years that God started redeeming our story. First of all, my kids got to see me and be with me every night as we read the scripture and went to the Lord for help. No one was helping us. Child Protective Services would come in and say, well, that's not a big enough bruise or that cut in her mouth isn't visible, so we can't help you and you can't leave. The only way this could ever, the way that I could ever have an out would be as he hurt me bad enough that legally he could be removed. So during those three years, like I say, were the most precious time for me and the Lord and my children in seeking him. And I want to read real quick my testimony verse that was revealed to me during those years. And it came from Isaiah 58, 9. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help. And he will say, here am I. And I felt that more then than I had ever in my life. I felt the Holy Spirit working through me and protecting me. And I could look back and see the protection through the years. So um, the help never really came. It never really helped. And after three years, I was finally beat enough that he could be removed from the home. And that was, we divorced a year later. Um, we'll talk later about forgiveness recon and reconciliation. There has been forgiveness in our lives um, between he and I, and we'll talk about that more. But looking back more, I just want you to see that my story is one of redemption, about a God who pursued me and loved me when I was disobedient and had such a hardened heart that I couldn't see him, and I wouldn't allow him. I was trying to control everything. So it's the sweetest story, and during all of that time, the gift that he was preparing for me, a second chance, and another husband I would have never, ever, ever expected. And that's the way I look at Jerry's and my marriage today. It is a gift that came out of this great hurt and from that day forward, and we'll talk about it more later, it's when Jerry and I committed 
to helping others with marriage because we were given a second chance that was not deserved. It's not the way God wanted it at that time, but through his grace and mercy, he allowed it. And it's been a sweet, sweet story. So we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm Jerry. I'm not the better half of this couple right here, but um, my marriage, my first marriage was different. Um, I, had been, I had been raised in the church, but uh, walked away uh, as a teenager, like so many of us do sometimes. And um, I, I saw my value in, in I guess, more f- the physicalness of a relationship. Um, my wife uh, and I uh, dated for a couple of years, and when we finally decided to get married, married, um, it went south pretty quickly. Um, within five years, we were separated. I wasn't walking with the Lord at the time. I was, I was all about me and um, what I wanted, and she was the same way. She grew up in a Catholic family, and I grew up in a brethren family. Um, <clears throat> Uh, selfishness was our way of life. We, we looked out for what we each wanted. And it creates a very, very unhealthy environment. It creates a very combative environment. Um, and when you're in the midst of that, uh, you're pretty much on your own if you're not walking with the Lord. So I have the comparison of having a marriage, uh, not having a relationship with the Lord, and one with having a very strong, I feel a very strong relationship with the Lord, with the Lord, and, and thanks to her, um, that's when I came back to the Lord because of the joy I saw that she had from a relationship with Christ, and I wanted that. I just didn't know, you know, how do you do that? So uh, even though my first marriage uh, ended in a divorce. I knew in the back of my mind that that it was wrong. I knew because of my upbringing in the church that that was not what God would honor. But at the time, I wasn't thinking about what God would honor or dishonor. It was more about me. Um, having said that, though, I did fight for the marriage. Um, I, we, I did get her to go to um, counseling, even though it was secular counseling, and that lasted one session because... She didn't like what this counselor was telling her. So that ended right away, and that was probably, uh, that, was, that was pretty much the end of that relationship. Um, <clears throat> I had two, two young boys that um, I was very concerned with, and that was probably my motivation for trying to keep the marriage together. It wasn't enough, um, and uh, we divorced. Years later, I met this wonderful lady here, and uh, there was something about her that I had never seen in, in someone that I was pursuing or someone who I would think of having a relationship, and it was this joy that she had about her, this, I don't know, I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it, and I finally realized that it was her relationship with, with, with the Lord that I was attracted to as much as I was attracted to her. And uh, we we uh, uh, we attended church together, even even though we were only dating. We we went to church together. We went as a, as family, two families. That was a challenge in itself, but we'll, we may get into that later. But I saw the grace of God that I didn't I had never seen in my life before. Um, I saw how God loves unconditionally, and I saw how that could fit in, into my marriage and my relationship with my wife, and that's, that's something that was foreign to me. I didn't understand that uh, uh, before. So uh, we went through a lot of premarital counseling, some very extensive premarital counseling before we got married. We, we, we dated for four years before we got married. We did premarital counseling. We did... Um, we took classes on uh, blending of uh, Jerry, I'm going to have to cut you off, man. I'm okay. going to have to cut you. Okay. okay. We just need to get to three more stories here. Thank you. 
You can have two more minutes of art. Sorry. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Lance uh, Schladeris, is my wife, Elaine. Um, and some of y'all may have seen our, our testimony as part of our, uh, our ministry, but we were told to boil it down to like <laughs> six minutes. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, ours is a story of, of, of uh, God's unconditional love, his mercy and grace, and how he, um, he not only saved me from what was most likely a, a, a terrible alcoholic death, he also saved our marriage and our family from the wreckage of alcohol addiction. We grew up here in Bernie back when it was a small town, um, and there was very little to do on the weekends except for drag main and um, hang out with friends, and that usually involved um, some drinking, especially on the guy's part. Yeah, we were uh, high school sweethearts. Actually, we started going together in, in uh, uh, the summer after our eighth grade year, and, uh, and we got... Uh, even though we, we went our separate ways through high school for a while, we always had this connection. We were, if I like to uh, call it, we, you know, or, or describe it as soulmates, if there ever was such a thing, because we were, even though we dated other folks and et cetera, et cetera, there was always this bond between us that, that wouldn't go away. And um, we graduated in 1984, and after a couple of years of college, we got married in 87. And I think even back then, I realized that uh, I didn't drink like a normal drinker, if there is such a thing. I always drank to excess from the very beginning. For the first 12 years of our marriage, um, Lance was what we call a high-functioning alcoholic. He could go to work all day and function and provide for the family and not have any problems. Um, then he would drink on weekends and in the evenings. And then at some point in there, I, I crossed over that, that uh, line the, to, uh, for which there's no going back across. I had, I had fallen into full-blown debilitating alcoholism. And it was uh, from, that, from that point... Ten years of me fighting. Ten, yeah. Uh, it was, it was for the next 10 years she fought and she did everything she could to try to, to try to get me to change my ways. I found out that there was no amount of uh, begging or pleading or threatening or loving him to get him uh, to stop. He had to make it to the bottom on his own. He was in and out of detox, um, but nothing, nothing ever seemed to work. Um, so the last few months of his drinking career, he did finally hit, hit bottom. Um, he had turned his back completely on God. Um, he found himself living alone in a disgusting apartment. Um, he was um, an unkept, nasty mess, consuming about a half gallon of vodka a day. Nothing else. He didn't take any other calories in. Um, he allowed the alcohol to take everything from him. He allowed it to take his family, his friends, his job, um, all the material things, but most importantly, the, the support that he had of his family. Um, April 10th of 2010, though, he um, made a decision to um, call the police on himself. And he begged them to uh, arrest him. And um, he just wanted to be separated from the alcohol so that he could um, get on with his life, I guess. Um, I had been working in the background. I had begged his probation officer to um, issue a warrant for his arrest, and they did. And so he was arrested. Um, I also went to the judge and begged them to give him the 90 days in um, rehab, which they did. And during that time, I told him that I was going to file for divorce that he was not the man that I had married 23 years ago. And I don't think he could argue with that very much. No, I certainly couldn't, couldn't uh, argue with that. I, I had gone from a guy that was willing to work three jobs while she stayed home with the kids um, when they were little to nothing more than a, an embarrassment and a financial burden. And, and 
just a, a basically a no good drunk. And uh, like she said, she uh, she filed for divorce. She said that uh, I wasn't the guy she'd married all that years, all those years ago. And I couldn't argue with that. And but she she also she gave me hope. Uh, she found it in her heart to to not close the door on us entirely. She told me, one, if you can stay sober and take care of yourself, we'll see what the future holds. And it was that little sliver of hope that gave me the strength to turn away from alcohol and to... Uh, to fall to my knees and ask God to help me because I couldn't do it anymore. And I'd ask God to, you know, I, like she said, did you talk about the rehab? I did. You did. Uh, so it was during that 90 days in rehab that, that, uh, that I got right with myself and I got right with God. And I asked him to remove the, uh, the obsession for alcohol, and he did. And I asked him to help me get my life back together. He did that too. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move we're gonna we're, we're gonna move over here. I just want to get to the the ba bare bones of the story, and then we'll get to the questions. Uh, Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand because I gotta see people. My name is Michael Edwards. Um, I have a divorce. I'm on my second marriage. Uh, I'm the oldest son. My father was an oldest son. Uh, my mother was the youngest of 13, but her culture, Japanese, the eldest son, always held a position of responsibility. Didn't really understand that. It seemed like I got in more trouble because I was the oldest. Um, I went through a period where um, my father was very physical to the point where I hated him. And so my goal was to get a job, get an education, and get gone. And so I went into the service, went into the Navy, and shortly after going into the Navy, I got angry at God and I left the church. And it's during that period and that lifestyle, I had an unplanned pregnancy. I married that young lady, and it lasted maybe three years, and that divorce is all on me because I was living in the secular world, and not in the biblical world, and what, what I knew, but I wasn't living. Go forward, I meet Tanya, and uh, as I'm going through this divorce, Tanya was in the Navy as well, and um, I just assumed divorced, a young child, I had a son who was 18 months at the time, that's two strikes, I was doing shift work in the military, so I would have no opportunity. What shocked me was when the word got out I was going to be getting a divorce, all the women I'd been working with saw me as an opportunity. Uh, Tanya actually started babysitting for me. Um, and she was uh, in, the, in the military. Uh, she was the sailor of the year at this large command that I was at. Uh, we ended up getting married. And we both brought into that marriage baggage, which we were totally unaware of. And the lifestyle I grew up with, my parents, they, uh, they were married for over 50 years. I will say this about my father. In the latter years, we were extremely close because of God's grace and reconciliation. And I miss him dearly to this day. Uh, Tanya grew up in a family where her father had a secret another family and left her mother and had this other family. Um, her mother had relationships with other men unbeknownst to her that uh, at an early age, Tanya was being uh, physically and sexually abused. And when I met her, what I saw was an incredibly beautiful and strong woman and a leader that tainted my vision of her in the sense of I saw her in a men's men dominated environment and I always saw her as successful. But what Tanya wanted for me was she didn't want to be the military woman. She wanted to be just a soft, loved woman. 
and we both lacked communication skills and we both brought baggage into it, Tanya and I will celebrate our 38th anniversary this year. All right. We have crossed the d divorce bridge nine or ten times to the point of attorneys and almost even to the point of we knew God didn't want it and doesn't like it. We are trying to get the other person to do it. That shows you just how messed up we were. Okay. So that's the short version. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, my name is David Burkett. I will, uh, my story could be really long, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a really short version. <laughs> um, I grew up in a little town called Marinci, Arizona, in a very Christian home. My dad was a deacon. My mom was the choir director. Uh, had great church, great friends. Everything seemed really good and perfect on the surface. Unbeknownst to everybody, uh, in my adolescence, I was being sexually abused by our pastor's adult son, uh, which confused me to the core, uh, obviously, and uh, had me pretty messed up. And uh, parents didn't know that until I was <clears throat> well into adulthood before I ever told them, told anybody about that. Um, but anyway, in that confusion and uh, being messed up about, you know, sex and stuff, I uh, was not living uh, the way that I wanted to at 21 years old. I'd gone through a pretty bad breakup, and uh, my, my brothers were 10 and 14 years older than me, and they were married, and they had children, and they had families, and I wanted that, and I wanted it bad, and I thought my life would be complete and full if I just had what they had. And so I really quickly married the first blonde that I could get a hold of that would marry me. I met her in June, got her pregnant in July, and married her in August. <laughs> and managed to make that marriage last five years uh, without church and without uh, following God in my life. Um, I became very resentful uh, in that marriage and uh, got to a point where I had reason to believe that she was not being faithful. And so I pulled out the I pulled out the Bible, the, the clause, you know, she's being unfaithful. God gave me permission. And so I used it and uh, I got out and every single one of those words that were on that slide, re resentful and selfish and unforgiving and irreconcilable. I was all of those things uh, just in a bad place uh, with that. And I, I left and um, it wasn't too much longer before I met my second wife. And uh, that was a logical choice. I had gotten burned by emotion. And so I met a girl that was great with my kids and my family all approved of her. And so, and I liked her a lot. <laughs> and so I married her more out of logic than anything and uh, made that marriage last uh, 10 years, but I couldn't ever love her. I didn't know how to love her. I liked her a lot, but I didn't know how to love her. And she couldn't live without that. And so after 10 years, she got tired of waiting for that and she left. And I fought and I begged and I cried and did everything I could to try to save that marriage. Uh, but. I didn't know how to love her. And so that married, uh, marriage ended. And um, so this is my third marriage. Luckily, I don't have any of those issues. God has blessed me immensely. <laughs> blessed me immensely uh, in this marriage and the things that I know now and the stuff that I've learned from this amazing couple right here and, and the Bible. Um, Divorce is, ne it will never be an option, with not even a thought in my mind with what I know now. And uh, so that's my story. Uh, it's, it's ironic that they gave the biggest talker like the least amount of time. So I'm going to go real fast. <laughs> uh, I, uh, <laughs> it, it was God's plan. Um, so uh, I will say um, I grew up in a broken home. My parents were divorced and they were both remarried people who had already been divorced and were remarried. So I have a crazy blended family. Um, they all claim to be believers, but I will not tell you that I grew up in a Christian home and that I knew what it looked like to follow Christ um, because I didn't. But I tell people that the Lord always had his hand on me. Um, and I was brought to church uh, by a church van in our neighborhood. Um, I became a Christian at a really young age. Uh, 
but what I knew about God was very, just very simple, that he was amazing and that he loved me and that he was all forgiving and that he wanted good for me. And so I was very confused about how to live my life. And um, because of my parents and their marriages, um, there was infidelity that we knew about at a young age. There was addiction. There was just a lot of yuck. Um, I didn't know what a healthy marriage looked like, but in my arrogance, I was never going to get divorced. Um, At 19, I was pregnant, and I like to tell people that I had my baby at 20. I was not a teen mom, Uh, (laughs) but I was literally 20 for 12 days before he was born. Um, At uh, I was 21 when I married his dad, um, seeing potential, um, and believing that that potential would continue to grow, right? Not that it would plateau. Um, but at this time, I was not following Christ in a Christ way. I would tell him what I wanted and trust that he was going to provide that for me because he loved me. But I didn't know how to sacrifice my life for him. Um, and he um, struggled with addiction, alcohol, and drugs. Um, we were divorced uh, within five years. Um, I was single for almost seven years, um, and I got married again, um, again, not living a life for Christ. He claimed to be a believer. I saw no fruit, but apparently when it came time to marry him, that didn't matter to me. Um, I had another baby, so now I'm baby number three, and um, six months into my marriage, I knew that I had made a terrible mistake. Um, He was very, very, very um, verbally abusive. And um, I believe if I would have stayed, it would have turned physical very quickly. Um, And so I I left and I was done. Um, So I found myself with these three young kids broken and in church. And I I didn't understand how I got here. If I was beautiful and I was strong and I was independent and I was brave, how did I get here? How did I get here? And the Lord said to me, because you are none of those things without me. And it was a changing point. Um, From that day on, I said, okay, I'm yours and I'm living a life for you. And my life has been totally redeemed. Amen. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. Okay, thank you for those stories. Well, there's a common denominator here of these marriages right now, and what is that? Yes, they all have God in the center of their marriage. We have different stories about distance from God, but what makes the marriage work now is God is at the center. So the panel questions, what advice did you receive Okay. Yeah. Based on time, it's hard to do a panel of four in an hour. It's, it's near impossible. So we're going to go to question five. What advice do you have for couples here tonight? Since we started over here, we'll start back over here. What advice do you have for couples here tonight? Um, the first advice I give is as you struggle, your marriage is going to struggle. It is do not let Satan tell you that you have to pretend everything is okay. You have got to reach out to a godly friend or a pastor or, and say, Hey, we're in trouble. And, and that can be just because you've been fighting for a week, because if you allow yourself to get hard, then you can't hear what the Lord has to say to you. And so do not hesitate. This church, we are broken people. We are broken people. And to go to your Christian friends and say, Hey, I'm struggling they're not surprised. They're struggling too. So don't, especially I think he attacks people in leadership positions um, because they think that somehow they're not able to serve if they're struggling. Do not let Satan tell you that because your godly friends are going to point you back to scripture. They're going to point you back to truth and they're going to remind you that God is for your family and for your marriage. If I could pick one thing, I would say that the, one of the biggest lies of the devil is that you married the wrong one. That if I would have just married the right person, then it would be different. And it looks like fire, smells like smoke, and comes straight from the pit of hell, lie from the devil. I can say this because my beautiful bride <laughs> uh, understands this concept. 
for me personally, if I knew what I knew now and had what I have now, I believe in my heart that all three, all the, both of my marriage, previous marriages could have been successful. I believe that if I would have led the way that I know I could have led, they would have followed me and I would have been happily married with either of those. They could have been the right one. There is not right one. What you need to do is you need to get right with the one. Oh, man. And he will turn you two to each other. Amen. I want to, yeah, no, go ahead. Um, love, anger, joy, forgiveness. There are emotions associated with all that. But love is a choice. Love is a decision. One of the lies I learned, kids aren't resilient. Kids are a great reason to stay in a marriage. Marriage is not a contract. It's a covenant. A contract is written to protect someone or to give someone else an advantage. You can't blame your marriage on God. You made the choice because he loved us so much. He gave us a free will, and you're responsible for exercising that will. You made the choice. It was your decision. God didn't place you in a bad situation. I always like to say that the devil works hard, and he is very cunning and... Um, pure evil. And with that being said, when Lance was as far away from God as possible, I was drawing closer and closer by just living in the book. And um, that would be what I would say is take all of the, get a study guide. It'll show you where to find whatever emotion or struggle you're having at that moment. And it'll tell you exactly what scripture. I would say one of the, the, the best things I, can, I think you can do as a married couple is to, uh, one, you have to communicate, and, and two, you pray together, you know, uh, spend time in prayer together. It, it, a, lot, a lot of uh, things that you aren't aware of will come to light just by listening to your partner as they pray, and a lot of things about yourself will come to light as you pray. Thank you. Um, I would say um, respect each other's feelings and the way they way each, uh, you weep or how you feel. Um, don't dismiss your spouse's feelings. Those are very true to your spouse, whether you understand how they got to feeling that way or not. They're very real to your spouse, and, and your feelings are very real to you. So don't, do not dismiss those feelings. Talk about them. Uh, communication is very important and something that has worked for us is um, we try to bless each other every day when trying to out bless each other do the things that you're not expected to do like I don't like I don't like uh, uh, emptying the dishwasher but I will surprise her every now and then and do that <laughs> so those little those little acts of kindness go a long way so um, just be considerate of your spouse. I think in all of our stories, you see the difference between the marriage with Christ in the center and not. Yeah. So we've all learned from that. Jerry kind of took my answer, but it's something that we really work on when we mentor couples as well. And so did Lance. Pray together. You hear what's on each other's hearts. Bless each other daily, especially when the other person doesn't deserve it. That's when it goes the farthest. Bless them daily and be in God's word together and alone. Because without that foundation with Christ, you're going to be back into that hard place. So make your marriage a priority, your spouse a priority. Um, study your spouse and know their likes and dislikes and love them well. Okay, thank you. A any questions from the audience that we want to take? Just the hardened? So, so a question's come up, how do you deal 
Um, and, and soon I have seen this as we walked alongside couples where one of the couples, you, however you say it, you can say one's leaning in, one's leaning out. And so let's say the one leaning out has hardened their heart. They're not receptive to God's word or to godly counsel. How do you deal with that? Can one person save a marriage? Yes, they can. Yes, you can. It takes one person to demonstrate God's grace and change. Your marriage didn't get in trouble overnight. There's some unmet need that you spent years ignoring or not hearing, and it will take you a little bit longer to deconstruct the wall that's there. And what was the question? Hardened heart. So if you're dealing with a hardened heart. Fear is real. And I think women at times can feel it more deeply and intensely. And if you've been married seven years and you're dealing with a divorce question, think of it this way. You spent seven years not meeting a need, and it's going to take a while to transition that valley. And... It's not uncommon for the person who's leaning outward to push the buttons to try to get the reaction that they're used to to justify, I need to get away from you. So God created us in a unique way that we have the ability to learn and change. And when I finally understood it's easier for me to change myself <laughs> instead of my spouse, but the harder thing was I didn't know my wife like I thought I knew her. And so I had to study her. If I spent five years pursuing a degree, how long should I spend pursuing my wife and understanding that I know her? Okay? I learned something new from my wife every day. I've always loved her. I don't always like her <laughs> and vice versa, but I've always known that I love her. We have both, my wife and I, experienced infidelity and I still love her. Thank you. Elaine, uh, I want to ask you specifically on this hardened heart because um, as I hear your story, uh, you, you, you went through the depths of uh, having an alcoholic husband and, and, and just all the misery that comes with that and the loss of hope. And it would be, in my mind, very hard for you to become hard-hearted. What, what kept you from becoming hard-hearted? Completely. 100% honest. I didn't do that. I didn't. I became hard hearted uh, for a bit. And then I realized um, three and a half years after he got sober, he asked me to remarry him. And I realized that the marriage absolutely would not work in the position that I was in with the anger and the embarrassment and the resentment and all that goes with what we had gone through. Um, and I literally hit my knees and ask God to remove that from my heart hmm. so that my marriage would work. And he did. And the only time that this ever comes up, that we ever talk about it, is when we're doing our testimony for our ministry. It's nothing that I ever hold over him. With nothing that, and I have seen that. I have seen people that, that keep going back to that, and their marriage is still struggling, where ours is in a, the best place it's ever been. Yeah. Joni, same question to you. You experienced abuse at, at a pretty severe degree. How did you not become hardened? Or did I, you? And I, then, I was yeah. hardened for many, many years, and it was forgiveness that finally broke those chains. Um, one of the best pieces of advice, of advice Jerry and I got when we were going to get married five years later was our pastor that was going to marry us ask each of us to go to our ex-spouse and ask for forgiveness in our part of it. That was very freeing 
Um, mm -hmm. It was harder for me because my husband was not, still to this day, is not willing to forgive. And that is, you know, it's kind of like a prodigal child. We just have to keep taking it to the foot of the cross, keep taking it to the Lord, keep praying because it's something that we can't control. But I feel like forgiveness is the beginning of a heart softening. Amen. And we talked about that last week, forgiveness, and then you can lead to reconciliation. Without, without forgiveness, there is no reconciliation. Okay, any other questions, comments, concerns? Any final comments from our panel? Thank you, panel, for, for your honesty and your candor. Yes. I, I would, real, I'll be real quick, I swear. Um, I do really want you guys to know that um, my history, um, part of my marriage is breaking. That's a generational thing that comes from my parents' divorce and seeing that and growing up in that. And I suffer the consequences of my parents' divorce today. Yes. And our grown children, who are big kids, are almost 27, they suffer the consequences of our marriage every day, of our divorce every day, <laughs> and the Don't consequences, <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, the consequences of, of our divorce. And even, <laughs> even our grandchildren, and, you know, we think about when they're, they're at birthday parties and they have to be with all the sets of their parents and all the, um, and listen, the Lord pours his favor over it and he, and he loves us. And there's so many blessings and they far outweigh the, the challenges, but to believe that you, if, if, yes, if you're in an abusive relationship, if you're, there are circumstances that you need to walk away from, please don't. But if you are two good-willed people that love the Lord, mm -hmm. you can save your marriage, and it is worth saving for your children and your future grandchildren. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Michelle was uh, answering the uh, question number four. What were the intended or unintended quest, uh, consequences? No, a, go ahead. A bad marriage is better than a good divorce. I'll tell you that. Do you have something? So, you know, we all speak English, but the environment we grew up in formulates our vocabulary and our understanding, and we all have unknown coping mechanisms that we adopted. Oh, yeah. That filter how we hear and see things. And the hardest thing for me is to understand my wife's dialect <laughs> and vice versa. She speaks one time. Yes. And even though I know what I mean, each one of you is going to hear it differently and walk away with a slightly different, maybe accurate, maybe totally off. But unless we have relationships, we can't hone in on what we're trying to say. Okay. I'd like to add one thing. Um, can I? Okay. okay. Um, this is mainly for the guys out here, and and this this fits in with ladies. You can do this too. When um, when we have a, a disagreement, or maybe we're arguing about something, I try to picture Jesus standing behind her, and how would I talk to her if Jesus was standing behind her? Well, guys. Jesus is standing behind her. Yes. Okay? So choose your words wisely. <laughs> choose your um, demeanor and your tone wisely. And uh, you'll be amazed at how God will honor that. Amen. The, uh, as we close out in prayer, uh, we all talked about what we heard these couples say. The other thing I heard was these couples have brought their pain into their story to give God the glory. Each of them have done that. And as our pastors tell us, we all have stories. 
And we are about to celebrate Easter, and our pastors talk to us about how it is one of the most open times that people are willing to hear the word that has made a difference in all of our marriages. And so the idea is, as we close, think about who you want to invite. Think about we are becoming a welcoming church, but are we a church where people can bring their junk to the foot of the cross and we come alongside in love and God's truth? So I want to, these people are so special the, to be open and sharing with all of us. And uh, I know I have been blessed by it. Uh, give them a hand again. Let's give them a special hand. Those those were not easy stories to tell. So thank you, panel, for doing that. Yeah. And uh, so with that reminder, next week, no Wednesday evening, we are not meeting. And then for the marriage, the week after, we're doing a wrap-up, and then we're doing an affirmation uh, exercise together uh, about your marriage. Any other comments? Let me close. Father God, thank you. Thank you for each couple up here. Thank you for each couple represented in this room, Lord. We, uh, because you give us free will, we can, we can mess things up, and yet you can redeem all things, Lord. You, all you ask is that we uh, enter it with forgiveness, and we enter it with a purpose of reconciliation. Thank you, Lord, that you've loved us so that we can love others. And we just ask your blessing now upon the marriages here and the marriages that uh, we can pour into, that we can speak truth in. Teach us to speak truth to, to marriages that are walking in difficulty. Thank you, Lord, for your per perfect design for marriage. We ask all these things in your holy, precious name. Amen.